everyone. Um, it is an awesome responsibility to stand before you and present God's word. One thing, one responsibility that I do not take lightly, and I pray that my words may be encouraging and helpful and edifying to you, and if that applies, correcting as well. Um, and if I misrepresent or say something that is not in God's word, please bring that to my attention. It is not my intent to misrepresent God in any way. These are the words of life, the words that we must live by, and the words that we will be judged by. This lesson is one of those lessons that took a long time to come to being. It ended up being two parts. It was a lesson that I started some time ago and just kind of got laid there. Because the first part of the lesson, you'll say, if you keep notes, you'll say, well, the first part of Gary's lesson was similar to the last couple of lessons that he preached. Okay, yeah, that, that's true. Because a profound thing happened in my life that really uh, or had a profound effect on my life that brought these lessons forth. But the second part of the lesson, um, or some of the ideas from the second part of the lesson came from an article that I read by Al Dieselkamp. I'll give him the credit right now. He said things that I couldn't have said any better. So I'm going to present them with some of my thoughts in there as well. So it's a two-parter, and um, you, you will see as, as we go along why I, well, I called it that. So the introduction, I guess you could call it um, anything you want to, um, how you deal with people on the outside world, opportunities with outsiders. Um, you know, and we as Christians are, we're dealing with people in the outside world. Um, the, the key here is, in this, this part, is sometimes, that's the key part, encounters with unbelievers seem like a necessary evil, an undesirable circumstance of living in the world, at best an inconvenient sometimes. Don't get me wrong, there are a lot of people out there in the world that are good people, really are good people, good to be around, you know, pleasant people, very enjoyable. Yes, but sometimes you are going to work with people who are, you name it, fill in the blank. Rich is shaking his head. He knows. I know. I took a job this summer. Started in early summer. I don't have that job now. I had that job. And I knew these things going in. But when I was thrown into the midst of that, I would leave there. I would be like, whoa, I just can't believe how some of these people talk look at on their phones, what they, how they act, and I was just like, I knew that going in, it's not like I'm a naive person living under a rock all my life, although I've hidden back on the farm for a lot of years, you know, at least laughing, you know, I, yeah, that's true, and you know, that's kind of a not bad place to hide sometimes, but, you know, um, you come in contact with these people, and you're dealing with this, you know, you, you does God love these, those people, yes, he does. You know, and I was there. You know, I was put there. Um, you know, sometimes you know you kind of get the feeling like Lot. Um, you know, Peter talked about Lot that his righteous soul was tormented in Second Peter chapter two. Um, you know, it, you know, in the context here of Second Peter two, he's talking about false teachers, and God is able to, you know, He's going to, you know, punish those who do evil, and you know, He's he knows how to deliver the righteous people. You know, he says in verse 7 8, And delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed with the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing of their lawless deeds. Okay. Lot was in a way worse situation or circumstance than I think likely that any of us will ever be in. I mean, God destroyed the city because he couldn't find... How many did Abraham get down to? Ten. Ten. That's, that's pretty long pretty bad. But sometimes, you know, you do come in contact with people who speak and do all kinds of evil. At this point here, you know, I mean, I, I was thrown into that, that work position where I couldn't believe that they actually spoke that way. I just absolutely could not believe it. And, you know, so, and, and you know, you know, you, you do. You, and I, I will confess that People like that, by and large, you want to avoid. Hide, get away from, you know, get as far away from these people as you can. You know, well, you know, what does God, you know, think of Jesus. Jesus came on the earth. You know, 
you know, the, the feelings are, are understandable. You know, if you're a Christian want to enjoy and witnessing sin, that is that is absolutely right. But Jesus, you know, his attitude towards sinners. You know, Matthew 9, uh, a couple passages here. Um, Matthew chapter 9, this is after Matthew is called. And he goes to Matthew's house. And he's sitting there eating with them. And uh, he says in verse 10, or the Matthew uh, chapter 9, verse 10, says, And so it was, as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus heard that and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. So to call those sinners to repentance, you've got to be amongst them sinners to call them to repentance at times. Now, not that you need to dwell with them all the time, but you need to be there. Um, we don't need to turn over Luke chapter 15, the, the, the parables, some of the parables, the lost sheep. The guy who has one sheep who's missing, the father has, you know, has created everybody in the entire world. One is lost. Go seek that lost one. Bring that one back. You may have to go in places that you do not find comfortable to go, but but you may be there. You try to seek that person. The coin, remember the woman turned the house upside down. Find that coin, that lost person. You know, to, to, to do that. And, you know, the parables is that, as, you know, as, as such, you know. So, so that, that leads me, left me with, you know, okay, I, you know, I'm in this position. And we may find ourselves in positions where we are amongst very ungodly people. So, what do we do? We do as God's children in those situations. Not that we desire to be there. We may be there for one reason or another. What do we do? Um, you know, a couple of passages here. Colossians chapter 4. Um, I'm sure that the lesson will be nothing new to any of you, but, but uh, hopefully encouraging. So Colossians 4. When um, Paul says, he says, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time, let your speech Always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you to, how you ought to answer each one. You know, you may be in a situation where people are very, very ungodly, and you know, you need to be careful of what you are doing. Um, the passage in John 17, verse 15, um, when Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17 there, he says in verse 15. I do not pray that you should take them, the ones that you have given, Father has given to Jesus. I do not pray that you would take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. We are in this world. We need to be, you know, protected from the evil one. We need to be God's representatives on this, on, on the, where we live, we are to be God's representatives. We are his workers. We need to be doing as he would have us to do. Um, there are opportunities out there. There are opportunities, even when we're amongst those who are very, very ungodly. Um, if they're doing things that, looking at things, on the, on, I'll use an example. The, 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 some of the guys would look at things on their cell phones. I did not look. I knew what they were looking at, even though I didn't look. But I knew, and I would not look. I would not look, even though they tried to show me. I would not turn and walk away. Hoping to set the right example. And one of the guys, before I left that job, did make note of that. You don't swear. And I told him this. I said, Does it make you look smarter or sound smarter to swear? He says, No. You know. He was one of the ones who was a little more, shall I say, Gentler, he knew, he could recognize. So, you know, it, it's it's what, how we act, how we act among them, you know. And as we go on the lesson, you'll see that some of the things that we are to do, you know, we are to conduct ourselves with wisdom towards those who are outside. It says in Colossians, we are to redeem the time. 
That is in stark contrast with avoiding outsiders at all costs. Yes, we are to be among them, make the most of our time, not to avoid them at all costs. Um, our conduct is to be above reproach. We are the light of the world. We talked about that this morning. Jesus was the true light. He came here. He's not here, but we are. We are to be his light. Okay, we are to be doing what is right in the Father's name to bring glory to Him, and hope to lead others to Him. Okay, and Peter goes on. Peter says <clears throat> in Second Peter twelve, or Second Peter, First Peter two twelve. Sorry, have your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evil doers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. We are to use the examples, or use the situations that we ha are, are given to teach people, or to live people, or show people God's high standards, and we are to be living them too. You know, if we say it, we better be living it. You know the old saying that your um, gun barrel can be just as straight as can be, and just as empty? Your doctrine can be just as straight as can be, but if you're not living it. You need to be living. If you say it, you better be living it. Okay? Why? We are going to be scrutinized. Yes, people on the outside, they are going to look at you. You know, I'm showing pictures on my phone. I, I want to see if you want to take a look at it. You know, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. You know, you say, you say, you know, you 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 um, do this, but I see you do that. Okay? You can fill in the blank anything you want to. You know, you know, you you say that you are, you know. You know, whatever it is, I don't do this, but then I see you do something else. You know, you fill in blank. There's all kinds of, you know, I treat my wife, you know, God says treat your wife a certain way, but I see you do this. Vice versa, husband, same thing, you know. Um, you know, and if, and if they say, well, well, you know, you say you're a Christian and you do that, well, I don't want to, I don't want to be a Christian, you know, I mean, that's doing what? It's, it's, it's bringing blasphemy against God's name. You know, they're going to speak evil of God. You know, this this is the, the idea here. We are not to, as Romans 2.24, the, the name of God is blasphemy among the Gentiles because of you. Let that not be me. You know, I'm black, things I'm doing are blasphemy of God's name? No. I, I better not. But rather, we need to be like this. Give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. They're going to say all kinds of bad things, but if you're not doing it, and they have no, they have no case against you at all. They have no case against you. Um, Ephesians chapter five, verses fifteen and sixteen. Um, I'm going to turn over there. Passage very parallel with Colossians. Um, he says, "See that you walk circumspectly." As the new King James, or carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Okay? You need to be very careful to redeem the time. The idea of redeeming the time is buying up the opportunity. That, that's the idea. Make the most of the opportunity that is placed before you. Make the most of that opportunity. You know, time. Time is, you know, time can be spent two different ways. You know, time can be spent well, or it can be wasted, or used for evil purposes. God gives each of us the time that we need to do what he wants us to do. It's up to us to make the most of that time. Just a couple of illustrations here. You know, we can spend our best time in things that God has approved. I mean, you could have a whole list of things. Honest labor, homemaking, wholesome recreation, gaining useful knowledge, Studying, meditating upon God's word, doing good to others, prayer, meditation. You can, I mean, you can just go on and on and on and on. Things that God approves. Spend our time doing it. Or we can spend our time, and you can have a whole list of things here, too. Pursuing evil, excessive idleness, seeking constant entertainment, failure to do what God expects. I mean, that's, that's a general. <laughs> Pursuing things that God has forbidden. I mean, and you can go, you can go bonkers with that. But you get the idea. God wants us to do this. Not 
this. You can spend your time either way. It gives you free choice. So <clears throat> this this was a this was a thing that um, you know it, it, I had to keep reminding myself. In, account, in encountering and communicating with an unbeliever should not be dreaded, especially those who are live in a very, very ungodly way, but consider an opportunity to be valued and seized makes the most of that time. The idea is you may have the opportunity to plant a small seed, even in a person who is absolutely, there was a fellow there who was absolutely determined to do what was wrong, completely. And I would come to work in the morning and smile and say, good morning to him. No, it ain't. Say something like that, you know. <laughs> Every single morning, I would make that, you know, conscious efforts to, to say something nice or good to him. Who knows? Maybe someday down the line, I will have a you know better opportunity. But the yeah, idea is to seize that opportunity. You know, it's the the idea of sowing that seed, you know, opportunity to to, to speak of the Lord and save a soul. That's that's uh, the, the the ultimate result. Answering false arguments uh, with the truth. There are there is a lot of um, you know an opportunity to uh, to uh, speak to to those who either do not know God or have a false idea of God, if you will, um, and to give you the idea to uh, the opportunity to to speak truthfully. Ephesians 4.15, we're writing Ephesians there, so back up, it says uh, that to speak the truth in love, um, that you may grow up in all things into him who is able, who is the head, Christ. You know, and what I want to draw from there is to, that we are to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. As we have opportunities, speak to those in love, speak the truth in love, and we may hope to lead them to Christ. And, you know, 1 Peter 3.15, you know, it says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready, be always ready to give an answer to everyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in you and meekness and fear. So be always ready to give an answer. Speak that answer with love. And it um, goes without saying, if you're going to be ready to give an answer to those who ask you, you need to know <laughs> what you believe so that you can give an honest answer. So there, there's your study in and uh, meditate upon God's word. So, <clears throat> Actions and our speech. Our words are to be with grace. Remember over in uh, Colossians where he says our um, words are to be with grace. says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Our speech is to be good and favorable to help others. Edifying, timely, gracious, true, spoken in love in order to have time, or in order to have a positive effect and be of genuine good to the hearer. So our speech is to be Edifying and helpful that it may impart grace and good to the hearer. And to speak in a manner that is seasoned with salt, pleasing. The idea of being seasoned with salt is one that is pleasing, pleasant, perhaps, not our, <clears throat> even having the preserving effect of saving a soul. Remember, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So, our speech is not what it should be. Then what is it good for? Nothing. Throw it out. Okay. So be careful with your words. Um, careful with your words. The opposite of that is. I mean, we have, there's no place for this. Harsh, vulgar, insulting. You know, you may find yourself around people who are that way. Don't be sucked into that. Don't be 
sucked into that. Be very, very careful. Um, Ephesians, once again, 431. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And again, over in 54. Neither filthiness, foolish talking, coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Your speech is to be wholesome. No insult for insult. <laughs> 1 Peter 3 9, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on contrary blessing, knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. And again, 2 Timothy 2 24 through 26, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel. Remember, must not quarrel. <laughs> Either in here or out there. Okay, don't quarrel. But gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. God will grant them, or if perhaps God will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been captive, but taken captive by it to do his will. Um, you know, as we have opportunities and we can engage people on the outside, as we start a conversation, you can begin to understand what the individual needs to know. Different people are on different are in different places. Um, Colossians four six says, "Let your speech always be seasoned with grace." Um, see, or, Let your speech always be yeah seasoned with grace. Or season, I must have misspoke. Or must have done that. But seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer each one. The point is that we may know how to answer each person. Different people are in different places. Okay. Um, this is easily illustrated. If somebody came to you and asked you how to get to New York City, the directions you give them would depend a great deal on where they are. If they're in Florida, it's going to look a lot different than they are if they're in Buffalo. You know, I mean that that's pretty easily and easily seen from Scripture too. That is very easily seen from Scripture. You know, different people have different starting points. Some have a little bit of understanding. Some are completely misunderstand the Scriptures. Some don't have any understanding at all. And, and Paul, this, he's a great example of this. In the synagogues, in, in Acts chapter 17, we'll turn there. Um, a couple of these are in Acts. So uh, Acts 17, um, the first three verses, <clears throat> he says, Now when they had passed through Apollos and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, um, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three to Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Okay, where did Paul start? He started in the Scriptures, because the people in the synagogue, they knew the Old Testament. They knew the scriptures, so he starts there and he points them to Christ. Okay, when he gets over to Athens, and later on in 17, verses 16 through 31, they, they, they have a statue to the unknown God because they don't know what they're doing. Okay, so he doesn't start there. He doesn't use the scriptures, you know. He, he uses, you know, things that they are familiar with to try to bring them to the Lord. And in Corinth, over in Acts chapter 19, he, um, he, he um, corrected some disciples who had an incomplete understanding and knowledge. Remember, Apollos was there. Um, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, finding some disciples. And he said to them, um, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said to him, We have not so much even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. He said to them, Into then what? Or into what? What then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. So he goes on to correct them. Okay, you guys were misinformed. I'm going to correct you on that. So the point is that each person is in a different spot. So the only way to know how to teach someone is to find out what they already know. It's the idea of talking with a person, striking up a conversation, so that you can start to be a good example and to lead them to the Lord. That is the, the uh, point that is... Part two is the is the what I call the second part. It's compelling speech. Um, so it's uh, primarily is in Luke. We'll turn it back over to Luke chapter fourteen. 
and we will spend the rest of the time, most of it, right here in this parable. It's the parable of the Great Supper. It's Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. Um, now, when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And sent his servants at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground. I must go and see it. I asked you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets um, <clears throat> and lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor, the maimed, and the lame, and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done, as you commanded, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. There's a lot of lessons in this parable here. I'm just going to get a few to uh, bring out the, the points that I want to make in the lesson. So, um, Obviously, he says, the master says to him in verse 23, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be full. He says, compel them to come in. Um, you know, the master, God, had prepared a great supper. Okay, that's clear. Those on the, we'll call the A invitation list, made excuses not to come in. We just heard of them. You know, good excuses? Yeah, you know, I bought a piece of ground, I bought some oxen, I got married. Okay, good excuses. They didn't come. They didn't come. Okay, now what? You know, the master, he, he sends a servant back out, bringing the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. And those who are on the, you can call that the B list, if you will. Okay, the master said to the servant again, C list, okay? Command, compel them. He commands him to go out and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Okay, what is the point? These are people, there, there are people out there that need compelling. Okay, that's, that's, there are people who need to be compelled, if you will. So, this brings me to the point. Are we compelling? This is an interesting word. You may not like the definition of this word. It's a very interesting word. Denotes to put constraint on, to constraint, whether by threat, entreaty, force, or persuasion. We're supposed to use those things? Well, you'll see what I mean in just a minute. <laughs> Compel. This is what Paul did to the saints when he's recounting his conversion over in Acts chapter 26. Uh, we can turn there quickly. Leave your finger back in Luke because we'll be back there. So over in Acts chapter 26, he's recounting um, his conversion, if you will, um, the, the, the events that surrounded his conversion. He is uh, talking to Agrippa at this point. He says in verse 11, um, and I, Paul, verse 11, um, he punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persuaded them even to foreign cities. So if you back up just a second here, Paul's using what method here? Constraint, threat, treat, force. Yeah, that's what Paul's doing, okay? <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'll, I'll get to the, our part in just a minute. <laughs> this is an uncomfortable word. Yes, it is. And it's supposed to comfort of the great supper servants isn't the point. The, the master says, look, you go and you compel them to come in. But the servants, the comfort of the servants was that the master's you know, point? No, not at all. Not at all. You compel. The importance was that they need to be at the supper. Okay? That was the important part. Okay? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Okay, um, that's in uh, 2 Corinthians 10.4. Our weapons are not car carnal, but compelling. Okay, here's the point. We're not using terrorism, threats, mun uh, manipulation, violence, confusion. We're not doing that. There may be some out there that do that. I don't go anymore. You guys know who I mean. But this is what we're to do. The back of the, the definition, the, um, 
the uh, uh, I've got to go back a second. Just the, the definition of the, the last part of the definition there was uh, persuasion. Yes, persuasion. We are to be thoughtful, kind, tactful. Okay, that's the point. Thoughtful, kind, and tactful. But the importance of our mission should motivate us to step outside of our comfort zone. That's where this really got, really, really spoke to me. Am I stepping outside of my comfort zone to try to help to bring others in, okay? Am I doing that? Yeah. Hold on for just a second here. Um, we, Gary Tweedy, needs to work on my ability to be compelling with scripture. Obviously, depending on the situation, we must be prepared to make compelling arguments for love, grace, history, evidence, wherever the person is, all centered on revealing the mystery of godliness. The, the mystery of godliness, uh, I mean, you know, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, Jesus, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed up in the world, received up in glory. This is the greatest story ever told. The greatest story ever told. We have salvation. God has sent his son died for us, we have salvation through his son. Shouldn't that just beam forth from us and compel others to come in? Think about it this way. How many television commercials from your youth can you remember? <laughs> I can, although I don't want to remember them. I think they're ridiculous. Shouldn't I be that way about Christ? You know, I mean, shouldn't I be that way about Christ? Uh, are you going to suffer rejection? Yep. Yep. You're going to suffer rejection. You're going to suffer, you know, ridicule. There, there's, you know, they're, they're going to speak evil of you. There's all kinds of things. But you know what we need to be careful of? Not to prejudge whether this person will accept the truth or not. We don't know that. We don't know that. We need to do our part. We need to do our part. And... I remember I, I remember a story that Newman Gupo Newman Gupo preaches in um, Zimbabwe, and he told a story one time. This is many years ago. I don't know. Was you around when John Newman Gupo was here? Okay, he came one time here, the, the, the church way back years ago, so help support him. And he had a little stand at his place and sold some vegetables and stuff. And whenever anybody would come, here he'd come trucking out the driveway with his Bible, and the men of the city or whoever would say. Oh no, here he comes again with his Bible. That's all he talks about. <laughs> you know? That's that's not a bad thing. <laughs> that's not a bad thing. <laughs> that's that's the way we should be, you know. Look, this guy, you know, we were talking about trucks and all of a sudden he's talking about, you know, God. What, what, what's up with this guy? That's the way we should be. You know, um, think about it this way. If each and every one of us in here had to bring someone to the Lord. Or had to. Would that motivate us a little bit more? If you don't, well, I, I'm going to step outside. This God didn't say this, but I'm going to say this. God said, if you don't bring somebody to the Lord, you're not getting to heaven. Wouldn't that uh, motivate us just a little bit harder? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep, that's Newman Google right there. <laughs> so, okay, our methods. Um, yeah, go to the highways, hedges, compel them to come in, compel them to come in. You know, create situations, you know, you know, con you know, make contact, plead, call in favors, talk to strangers, invite, you know, people that you might want to come. You know, be creative, bold, risk rejection, mockery, even comfortable, if you be uncomfortable and awkward, you know, that's what we need to do. You know, our master says, Tell them to come in. As his servants, we don't get to say we're not comfortable with that idea of compelling to bring other people in. That, we don't get to say that. God said, do it. He says, just do it. Do what you can to try to bring them in. You know, is it going to be awkward and difficult? Yes. But Paul said in Romans 8, 18, you know, the things that we suffer here cannot even begin to compare with the glories that awaits us. Okay? So, some thoughts on the conclusion. 
the best way to put into effect Colossians 4, 5, 6 is to use Jesus to save them. Walk in truth, bring glory to the Father. Do you want to recoil at the sight of sinners? I do. I will confess to all of you standing here. I do. I, I hear them talking that way and things like that. I just, I want to run in your direction. I'm like, no way, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Maybe God doesn't want me to be out of here. Maybe there's a reason that I'm there, okay? I should put love there. Speak sinners, fullness, grace, love, okay? <clears throat> Questions and discussion. It may be the stupidest question in the world, but it's a question. It opens a conversation, okay? Be willing, be willing to engage into that. You know, tell them what they need to hear, obviously, in love. Make the most of every opportunity. You know, conduct ourselves with wisdom toward outsiders or unbelievers. May our speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt. You have to respond to each person, compelling, be sure to convey the preciousness of their soul and the sanctity of God's word. Do not compromise on this word one iota, not one little bit. Do not compromise on that word. Speak it, but speak it in love. That's what we need to do. That is my lesson. I thank you all greatly. Um, if uh, there's any way that we can help anyone in here, if you're not a Christian, or if you have questions about anything that I've said, or you like the prayers of the congregation, any way we, we, we can help you, we would love to. We would love to. You know, it is, it is my goal and all the members of the congregation here that all of us get to heaven. We need to help each other. So if we can help you in any way, we would like to, either now or any time. So we offer this invitation as we stand and sing the song that.